Welcome to Microsoft Virtual Academy, Windows Security and Forensic class, module four. In this module, I'm gonna have Raymond Komalius with me. Probably you know Raymond. In our first MBA, which I recorded at Milad, he was one of the moderators, supporting us from Netherlands. Um, beside that, I done many tech at Ignite sessions with him. Yes. Uh, Raymond, who are you? Can you please introduce well, yourself quickly? My name quickly? is uh, Raymond Convalius. I am a certified trainer and consultant from the Netherlands. I usually uh, do a lot of uh, consultancy gigs with large companies where I uh, help implementing Microsoft technology. And of course, I am a speaker on multiple uh, conferences nationally and internationally together with Erdl, among others. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. So what are we going to cover in this session? Um, I think we know the module. This module is the Windows Forensics module. And we are going to cover what is digital forensics, why do we need digital forensics? What types of digital forensic analysis is there? We will cover incident response, hash values, how we can get forensic images, how we can do f forensic analysis, and what is really important in Windows that you need to know with examples from real life. All right, digital forensics, what is it? We did talk about it in module one with Hassan Tugera. So, uh, it's still the same, nothing has changed. There are different types of uh, forensic requests, like institution analysis, damage assessment, suspect examination, tool analysis, log file analysis, evidence search. So uh, I think the name is uh, telling on what it is, how it works. But when we come to this, it's really important to understand what's going on. Raymond, can you please give us some examples here? Well, of course, uh, the first thing that you have to know, if something is going on, you have to know what has actually happened. So, where did the intruder come from? Where did the intrusion come from? What actually happened? Before you start throwing away all sorts of stuff and moving around your stuff and trying to fix things that may have been broken, you have to actually know what is really going on on your systems. And if you have any idea of what is going on, then you can make a plan to find out what did they actually do, when did it happen, make sure that you know why did they do it the way they did it, and did they find a weak spot. And the thing here is that you have to know what your infrastructure actually looks like before you know how to, how they actually, how they which, found Which we covered with Hassan already, right? Yes. So, uh, digital forensics has Lots of processes. And uh, it all starts with evidence preservation. Then you have to accuse the evidence, you have to examine the evidence, you have to analyze the evidence, and it all comes to the reporting. Okay, um, if, if you say that, then it's really important in the beginning that you are not trying, that you're not trying to fix things while you're removing all the evidence. Um, Yes, that's why usually in forens forensic is not fixing things anyway, but probably you mentioned this from the security perspective, right? Yeah. Where we fix things, or as Hassan mentioned in the previous session, we can use this in different aspects, but if we're gonna use in law, uh, sorry, in court, then we won't fix things, it's not our job. But if it's an attack and you are the security expert, it's a bit different. Okay, incident response. How is incident response happening? First of all, you have to plan and identify the job roles. The incident response team should be able to initiate, record, and evaluate and analyze the findings. He or she has to be able to look at what is contained. If, uh, if possible, mitigate, identify. Now, this is not forensics, right? Escalate the issue, recover, Review, and most of the time, we usually do lessons learned. But as we all know, or as you should know, forensics and incident response are two separate teams which work together. All right, first responder. What is a first responder? Well, the first responder is the one who is entering the, 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 the scene, the crime scene. And that's the one who has to, to make sure that he clears up the, climb, the crime scene in a way that nobody can en enter there, that nobody can, can take away the traces that are there. And then 
you can start your investigation. So it's like the policemen will come to, to with, with their, their, their stuff to make sure that nobody can enter the crime scene. This brings us back to the slide tag, okay? If you look in the acquisition, we have our desktops, laptops, server, uh, or servers, tablets, smartphones, network, and the cloud. So incidents could be happen in any of these. And it's our job to be able to look into the flash memories, maybe phone, disks, uh, faxes, printers, so anything which might have traces, including my Band 2, which I love, which is just came out and I love it, you know. Um, to be honest, I didn't put my hands into it now, but I'm curious uh, what it holds before it's been transmitted. Why? It could be someone get killed, right? And they have GPS enabled, and me as forensic examiner, I should be able to see uh, where this innocent, innocent went and how I can get information from this. Yeah. So, what if the system is shut down? Then it's, the life is easy. What we will do is, we can just take an image of the hard drive, uh, we can add a boot to the computer, we, from there we can get the system state reports, we can get the working processes, we can see what ports are open, if necessary, we can take an image of the RAM, capture the network traffic, which will make our life a bit easier. So, what is the incident response? This is my old Windows 98 uh, or NT4 desktop. I use it all for a reason. Uh, you can see icons, you can see executed applications, you can see the system tray, which will give us lots of information. In the incident response, if the system is working, it's much easier to get the system report and see the working processes, open ports, or where we can uh, capture the drives. And this brings me to my first demo. Uh, and here, I'm going to drive uh, image a uh, hard drive. For that, remember in the first session when I had Hussein, I showed you our disk imaging tools. I'm going to plug one in and I'm going to show you uh, quickly how we can do that. For that, I'm switching to my demo machine. All right, uh, here you will see that uh, I'm just creating, going to my software, selecting my image disk, I'm selecting the image location. And, you know, you can just go select the hard drive that you want to image. In this case, the USB to make it faster. And I name it as USB. Drive, forensic image, active finish. It will take some time and I will be able to get a quick image of my memory stick. Why do we need that? Because in a court case, I'm not able to, I'm not allowed to be used in the, for example, here's my image, live image. I should be able to duplicate that, then do my analysis on it. That's rule number one. You have to make sure that you make no changes to the evidence. Yes, exactly. Otherwise, I can't use it in the court. This will bring me to my second demo. Um, if you remember, together with Hussein, we showed what is inside the RAM. How can we dump RAM images live? But in this case, I'm going to show you how we can uh, duplicate the RAM via software. For this, I'm using my imaging tool. Let's go back to my demo machine. All right, I'm opening my software. Go to my tools. As you can see, I selected RAM. I include uh, the steps there. I get the RAM image. And that's that easy. Um, if your name is not Hussein de Wolf, then um, this is the easier way for you to capture the RAM. Uh, of course, you need to have the software and the admin tools, and uh, most of the time you are not able to install some stuff to the hard drive as well, right? right. But uh, you can use some um, portable tools, or what you can do is 
Uh, remember, once you're imaging the RAM, you can just work on it easily. And again, this will take some time, but I think you understand the process. This uh, brings us to another important topic, dear Raymond. Yes. So, now, how can I verify this hard drive or RAM image is the same image that you took? Because the lawyers at court is going to make a lot hard. They're going to say, hey, this has changed, this has changed, this is not belonging to this. How can you prove in a court case that the RAM image is the image that you took originally? Well, I think you have to record every step you take. Yeah, and uh, what else do you do? Keep a log. And take, we take, take the hashes, I think. Hashes, right? In, why? Because hashes are the easiest way to be able to verify. So, uh, hash, even when you download some uh, software from Microsoft, from MSDN, what happens? It's usually, they usually give the hash number. Yes. To be able to prove to you that, hey, that's what we gave you. If you download something and the hash is different, it could be man in the middle attack that someone is injecting maybe something to your traffic. So that's why it's important to uh, understand hashes. So can you please tell us what the hash value is? Oh, the hash value is actually, it's, a kind, it's kind of a fingerprint of your files. Every file has, has certain content. And when you create a hash, this is the unique value that's related to the current contents of that file. If you change a single bit, the hash will completely change. So there is always a way to tell that this has been the original file because of the hash that you took of, at the time that you found it. So hashing could be via MD5 or SHA-1. Uh, it's basically an evidence. Now, if you check the slide, uh, here I explained, uh, you can see here, the acquisition hash and the verification hash, which both of them are same, which proves that nothing has changed. The MD5, it's a message digit algorithm, which is an algorithm, it's used to verify data integrity, and it's using 120K uh, bit message digits from data input that's claimed to be a unique to a specific data fingerprint and to a specific individual. SHA, which is the secure hash algorithm, is one of the most common used uh, cryptographic hash function. It's designed here in the States and published as a government standard. So, um, how, do you, how do you create the hashes? All right. Uh, do you have a, I think we got a demo for that. Well, the, the funny thing is that my Windows doesn't have anything easy to show the Inbuilt. hashes yes, you're right. built in. But there is PowerShell. And ah. there is a group of people, especially they call themselves the PowerShell community, who created the PowerShell community extensions, and they created a, 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 a function for that. It's just as simple as that, and I, I will show you that please. now, Sh can you in please a short, short demo. Yes. Because all you have to do is download the PowerShell community extensions. I have a link for that later in the deck. And if you have that on your system, I can import the module for the PowerShell community extensions. And after you have imported the module, then there's just a very easy thing. Usually you just do it there to show your files. Let's show my sysinternals folder, which shows the files that I have in that folder. And if I output the contents of that folder to the get hash um, command, then I will just get the hashes for all those files. So I can send the output to the get hash command. And then the output looks like this. And this, those are the MD5 hashes for those files. So I don't have to install any third party tool. Nope. It's inbuilt in PowerShell, thanks to the community. Exactly. And uh, this quickly verifies that what was been taken and what it is. So 
Thank you. It was a cool demo. And to be very honest, uh, while we were preparing this course, I didn't even know about this extension where Raymond made this uh, clear to me. So even I'm here to, we are here to teach you something, I'm learning myself as well, thanks to my partners Hussain and Raymond. All right. Now we got the image. Yes. What can we have to do the analysis? So uh, Windows Forensic Analysis includes file signatures, extensions, attributes. We have our file system properties. We have our operating system installation, the date, the time. We have our process baseline. And we have the logs where we can see when people logged in, logged out, shut down, password has changed. But uh, how can we see all this? What are the common imaging formats in forensics? Well, you, you have to preserve your image. The images of your hard drive. So, yes, you have, to, you have stuff like ISO, VHD, VMX, and, and all sorts of other image formats that you can use as a drive. You can use as a, an exact copy of the drive to, to show you what, what the drive looked like at the moment you started your investigation. Which is cool. Um, we can use also many different software. Again, um, to be honest, I'm not recommending any of these. They are all commercial software. You can just uh, buy the one that you like. There are some, um, uh, I think, open source one as well. And you can see the free ones here. Uh, FTK Imager, Encase Imager, Forensic Imager from Get Data, uh, TechPad Reddit Pro Discover. They are the free ones. Please go ahead. And the best one probably you notice at the very right is <laughs> this to VHD yeah, that's from Sys Internals, Microsoft, uh, which will help you also to get disk as VHD. I mean, uh, I used to use this tool when virtualization was started to get popular. Uh, I used to, you know, get my computer, image it, and share it across. But this is also a perfect forensic tool, which can be used. Yeah, because it, and the easy thing is you can you can easily mount a VHD and you can easily mount it as a read-only disk. So then you have this this image that is guaranteed without any change. All right, uh, I just spoke about already what Windows Forensic Analysis requires, right? So the important things here, we should be able to see the logs. Forensics or Windows, it's all about registry. We should be able to browse the registry, uh, prefetch the files. Could be a printer, could be uh, a shortcut to the links, but everything is kept in Windows for us to be able to look into it. Uh, it's also important to look at the restore points, the VSS copies, the TomDB files, recycle bin, unallocated clusters, and emails. This is a, these are usually the files that we look into it. Yeah, but all those areas, some of those areas, areas actually they contain historic information in themselves but others are dynamic. And for those dynamic parts, I recommend that you create a baseline, that you know how these historically looked like. So, uh, for instance, your processes, what are the processes that have been originally been running on all your systems? So that, that will make it much easier for you to recognize if anything irregular is going on, if any new processes start occurring and on a certain moment, if you have those baseline logs available. All right. Uh, when we say Windows Forensic Analysis, as you said, some stuff are dynamic. Some file extension can be changed, some fo file properties can be uh, changed, maybe some stuff will be deleted. Uh, if you remember, we did mention it with Hussain, when some things get deleted, it will just be unmarked to be ready to be all written. Even if you all write it, you can use uh, some tools to get the data uh, from both things. Uh, file names can be changed, file can be encrypted, but all these are really not that to worry. If you have a proper forensic software dongle, plug it in, uh, you can really get uh, lots of data out to investigate. 
All right, why is this important? Because we know that files can be manipulated. I mean, Hussein done really some great demos. Uh, and he showed that how easy we can uh, get access. Yes, we didn't show maybe how we can manipulate a file, but for this, I'm gonna recommend my previous MEA again. Please go ahead and watch it. I showed that how you can create a virus, how you can uh, combine a virus with a legitimate exe file and uh, make it as compile it as one and send it across which we had also in our tech ad sessions in in that case it's handy if you have a historic overview of your hashes so that will make you aware of any changes that are taking place in your file system that you don't know of because that currently that's a little bit harder because you you, you regularly have updates of your files but you know when the update has taken place and when, when certain hashes are about to change. If a hash is changing on a moment that is, cannot be explained because of uh, an update being installed, that's the moment you have to be aware that something might have gone wrong and that you have to look into the reason of the changes of the, of the hashes of those files. Now, I'm gonna come to another point, PowerShell. I mean, uh, after watching Hussein's session, probably you're gonna be scared using PowerShell, but no, no, no. There is nothing to be scared, why? Because Hassan showed you how people can abuse it. Now, Raymond, can you please show our uh, Virtual Academy students how PowerShell can be used for forensics? How you can create XMLs, how you can detail, how you can get details of the files, and you already showcased how we can create hashes, but maybe you have some extra uh, things to show us, Raymond? Well, yes, the, the nice thing about PowerShell is that it's all object-based. So if you do a simple thing with PowerShell, like uh, doing a, a, a dir to show the files in a folder, it shows you the files in the folder, but what actually comes back here are objects, rich objects with a lot of information. And what you can do, for instance, if you want to make sure that you have a baseline of what your file system looks like, well, you can do something like this dir of the C drive and then make sure you do it recursive so that you have a directory of every file on your C drive. Then you can export what comes back because I, when I enter now, I will get a whole shipload of what's on my C drive. It will be a lot, but I can export it. I can export it to an XML. I can export it to a CSV file or to a text file. XML is mostly one of the easiest ones. And if I created this XML file, I can use the XML file as the complete output of this command. Well, just to make sure that I have a small XML file here, let's do it like this. Um, I will create an XML file of the contents of my sysinternals folder. And I'm gonna pipe the output to my demo folder like this. I'll pipe it and export an XML file to D demo. That's not D, it's C demo. Sys internals. XML. So when I do this, you would think that it will just be like this in that file, c backslash sysinternals, but there is a lot more in here. And that's, I can show it like this. I can show you like this. I can say, well, I have a variable, the sysinternals files that equals the import of the XML that I just created. The demo, C demo. I don't know where I'm. At. C demo. Something is going wrong here. Can happen. We're humans. We make mistakes. C demo. Sys internals XML. And when I'm gonna look into the contents of this, I can do something like this. Look at it, and then tell me what's in here. For instance, give me the file 
that looks like this. Oops. And show me everything that's in there. And now you see that it's not just the auto runs file that it shows, it shows the auto runs file and it shows every property of the auto runs file because the object is much richer than just the file name, it's the file and everything there is to know about this file. So you see all the version info in here and you see everything about when it's created, when it was accessed, everything, when it was written and it's archived. This information does not contain the hash. So if you want to have the hash on this file, you also have to use the get hash, uh, the get hash uh, command to create the hashes for all these files. But this way you can have an overview of an historic overview of every file in your system created by PowerShell. Cool. This brings us to the next point. So now we have a baseline. Why? Because we know things are changing in a computer, right? We might have uh, someone formatting the computer, installing some stuff. Uh, what about, is there any PowerShell component where we compare running processes? Like get process, uh, exp you know, can you do the demo? I mean, I got the scr yeah, uh, script Yeah, we can here. do the same, the same thing with, with processes. And, and the nice thing is that you cannot just get an overview of all your processes and, and, and all the, the, the properties of the processes, but you can also start comparing stuff. So for instance, let me show you this in my short demo. If I use get process, it will show me just all the processes that are running on my system. This is easy. But I can output this, like this, get process. Export CLI. And then export it to my demo folder and call it process1.xml. You can name it whatever you like, just, just, just for the clearness, I, I named it process1.xml. Now, I am creating an XML file that contains all my currently running processes. Now, when I make a change to my running processes on my system and I create a new XML file, this new XML file will contain the new set of running processes. Now, and how do I easily find the differences between the first one and the second one? By comparing them? Yes. So you should be able to get a compare object command and uh, get the first process and second process and run the uh, PowerShell hopefully to be able to grab this for me. Yeah, for instance, I'm now starting Notepad just as an example. And when I now create a new XML file, I have two XML files. And one has Notepad in it, and one doesn't have Notepad in it. And in it, and how should I find out about this? Can you show me the uh, details? Maybe we get process details, and we process it out, print it out. Can you do that for me? Well, we, we shouldn't print them out. The easy way is just use printing PowerShell. Screen, I mean, uh, not just use PowerShell. Paper. PowerShell has a, has a, has a command that says compare object, mm. and what you can do is. Make sure that you have two objects, one with the first set of processes and one with the second set of processes. So what I'll do is I'll create one with the first set of processes, which has the import of cdemo1. Something is going wrong here. I did Try again. the wrong command. No, no, there is an error in my command, but I lost my cursor for some reason, so. Yeah, it's okay, no problem. Like this. And I have the second set. And Perfect. And now I can start comparing these. So I can do something like this, compare 
object. Object for process one and compare it to process two. Property. On the property. Process name. Process name, exactly. And? And now it it's tells me. Bad. There is one difference between those two sets of processes. It's Notepad. So I don't have to open the files and go nope. through the list uh, and say, okay, that's uh, not. So, no, so PowerShell is doing this to me. So what you can do, for instance, is that you regularly create a job that does the the export for you to a to a central folder, and then once in a while you check if the contents of the of the running process is the same as it was before. And uh, maybe it doesn't make that much sense when we show it to you with a notepad, but think about a computer which has hundreds of applications installed before and after. This is a very handy tool. Um, do you have to really know PowerShell? Is there not something inbuilt which uh, Windows showed to me? Uh, if you check quickly my uh, slide deck, you will see that Windows 10 has something which can show all this to me as well. What is it called, Raymond? Yeah, there is this uh, reliability uh, history. And this is something that was actually introduced in Windows, I think in Windows Vista even. We, uh, I think, yeah. It's, 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 it's been there for a while. 2008, I think, 2008 or 2000, I don't remember, but... Well, Vista was there before 2008. Oh, okay, yeah. But it came together in the <laughs> same, same code. But it's actually here, it's, it's here in your control panel and, and, and it has always, it, this is valuable information for everyone because you, you know, the, the standard answer of anyone where you are asking what did you do with your system when something goes wrong is I did nothing. Nothing has changed. I don't know I done anything done. about what happened. But with the reliability history, you have hard evidence in your hands. And it's as easy as this, I'll show, I'll show you. You go to the control panel, Look for reliability and you say view reliability history. And then it's creating a report for you. And the report is showing that my system is not being, not has been, hasn't been very stable for the, for the last period of time. Um, I guess why? <laughs> for our next demo, I guess. <laughs> Probably. But what you see here is that it shows you per date what happened, shows you critical events of, um, applications that crashed, and it shows you informational events of ins installations that you did. And that's for the date historically. So if you see that your system suddenly starts behaving different, like on this date that I did something, and you see that the, the reliability of your system suddenly drops, you can tell what happened on that date. And it will show me here that I did a couple of software updates. And after those software updates, something probably went wrong. Or maybe it was the day after that something went wrong. Well, I think it was this day that I installed a number of applications and drivers that made things, made things not work so well anymore. So this is also a very good way to see what has actually happened to your systems historically and, and why have the stability of your systems changed. Cool. All right, this brings us to the other topic then. So I said people log in, log out, and this will just have everything, right? So of course this can't be used in a forensic matter. For that we have to have access to the logs. And when I say logs, this is usually the system event logs, security event logs, application, setup, PowerShell, now we understand why we have logs for PowerShell. I mean, Hussain's and um, um, Raymond's two demos is a really good uh, setup. Also, your hardware logs, your other event logs are here important to view as well. I mean, uh, you can use also PowerShell to get these logs. Uh, we can just use um, the, the, the commands that you can on the screen. Yeah. And you can just get the output. Uh, but there is also one other thing which is important. If you remember, in the very beginning, we were talking about registry. Yeah. So I think this is obvious. Uh, everybody know how to use registry. We can just go to, to track edit. 
and that's not my system, sorry. The system hives didn't change, it's still the same. You can see the HK classes root, current user, local machine users, current config, which will have uh, the sources that we need for forensic analysis. Uh, what is a prefetch file? How can we use prefetch file, Raymond? I have no idea, tell me. Okay, Marks have created a prefetch uh, cache to improve boot and application launch time. What it does is, uh, via caching the commonly used applications, the operating system, in this case Windows 10, can determine what is used by systems resources or how is Windows accessing the application. When the application launch up, we can see if there is any update. And this will be in C Windows prefetch file where everything is hold and the extension will be PF. So it's basically a way for us to be able to view what is going on in our computer. And us forensics expert, okay, experts will look into these files to be able to see what has changed during booting. Could be a rootkit, could be uh, some sort of uh, application which was manipulated. Okay, now, so, now I know where you're heading it. So this, this prefetch mechanism was there to speed up the boot for Windows. Exactly. And, and what it did is it tried to predict what you were planning to do after you booted your system. So it preloaded everything, so that if you clicked Word, for instance, every time after you booted, it had preloaded Word, so that it was there in a the snap. And now you use the contents for your forensic analysis. So if Word has changed, then the cache became invalid, and you know something has changed. Exactly. Okay. Perfect example, thank you. Um, this can be also uh, replicated in printers, printer spooling, why? Because might be uh, someone done something and they're printing, or could be a letter which was sent out, uh, you know, Raymond, I'm going to kill you. Uh, print it out, I send it to you by mail. We can, you know, look into the spool printer folder in our computer to see if I really wrote this and printed from my computer. For that, all what you have to do is go to system, 32 spool printers folder, and you can see the spool data in the SPL files. Or the .shd files are the shadow files contain the job settings, which gives us proof. What else can be done? Spooler files. For that, you can go and download the free uh, splweave.exe from the website, which will be able to show you what was printed and when and how. So it will give you lots of information. And in this case, if I send you this letter, this is a good proof that it was printed from my computer. Well, um, this is something that you can find in Windows, but you will usually find the backup of, of, of your evidence in the printer itself. Because lots of printers have hard drives in there that actually the network contain, printers, yes. the large network printers have hard drive in there and that contains every letter that has ever been printed on that, on that printer. Well, the only so issue with that in terms of forensics, yes. uh, hard drives in big printers in a very common environment, it's commonly, uh, not, not commonly, continuously overwritten. And um, this can, you know, if you're going to do forensic analysis, uh, unless you have the hardware forensic analyzer, it's really uh, hard to get the data because the file has been constantly or written or written or written, which will maybe bring the quality down in terms of restoring the data that you're after. But you're right, it's also a way of getting it out. Okay. Uh, after that, we should be able to know how Windows works. Windows usually creates shortcut file links. Uh, which we call info2, which contains records that are corresponded to each deleted file in the recycle bin. It has a record number, it has the drive designator, it has a stamp with the time on it, and how and when it was moved to the recycle bin. Of course, it's gonna have the file size, the original name, full path, and the ASCII or Unicode information. 
air files, which is sent to the recycle bin, are maintained according to the specific naming convention. In this case, D, the original drive letter, could be C or A, Z, Z, sorry, this is America. Uh, number and or, dot original extension. This will be a way to C. Raymond? Is this also true for the files that you have deleted from the recycle bin? Uh, yes, don't forget, when you delete it from recycle bin, it's not actually deleted. It's just been marked for overwrite. I mean, that's, I know I repeated this before, but in reality, don't delete that. And even if you defragment your computer, which you, which you recommend unless you're using SSD hard drives, uh, the clusters software can easily, or hardware can easily see what you have done. Now, uh, I want to mention the restore points. We're doing forensics here, right? The volume shadow copy. Uh, restore points are created to allow us, the users, to have different choices in the system state. What happened? Um, remember, I think since Windows XP there, if you do something wrong, you can just go to previous restore point, which you can just uh, get rid of what you have done after that restore point. Uh, system restore has an automatic restore point, a space management feature that usually deletes all the old restore points to make room to the new ones. And you can set this easily up. But for me as a forensic analyzer, it is really important that uh, I know what has been there. Uh, in a VM environment and Hyper-V or other competitors, it's easy. You have the snapshot and you will be able to see the snapshot details which been logged. But in Windows, it's not been really logged. But you should be able as a forensic analyzer to suspect that, hey, there must be something happen. Or uh, if, I mean, you probably notice when you install a Windows update, when you install the new software, Windows will automatically create a system point. Yeah. But some people, can uh, misuse this and uh, you know they can do some uh, behavior, you know misbehavioral action go to the previous sister point uh, system point, point yeah. and there you as a forensic analyzer you might be have to uh, see what has been done because uh, the smart suspect will not be able to think that it can be seen what has been done and I got a real case example for this uh, which I'm going to talk later where are they stored? Let's quickly have a look at our slide. If you go to see system volume information, you will see all restore points here. And what if it was been full and been deleted? Doesn't matter. Here is my uh, forensic tool, uh, which you can restore everything from the hard drive. And more importantly, you can only get the differences as well. For that, here is the software. I just plug it in. It's in a dongle, I plug it in, and it will automatically sort it out for me. It's like your PowerShell, and it's quite useful, which I'm going to show in the next demo. That's very cool. All right, what is the thumb.db files? This is the thumb files, the, the thumb thumbnails of your pictures. Yes, of the images in any folder. Usually, you have OLE embedded data present in the thumbs file, and in many cases, the images probably been deleted from the directory, but hey, they are still sitting in the cache where uh, if you're doing something illegal and the police comes and uh, investigates your computer, that's where they find it. So I'm not telling you I do illegal stuff and police, but I'm telling you, uh, everything has been traced and uh, thanks God Windows is built in a way that uh, it's in a good way and a bad way. In a good way you can just get everything bad. In a bad way if you do something bad it's been logged. Yeah. Which gives us the administrators, the security experts, a um, way to gain all this information. So the thumbnail cache may contain information of files that you once had and yes. that are no longer there on your system. Yes. So a few minutes ago we talked about Fragmentation. What about unlock unallocated clusters, slack spaces? Uh, the unallocated space or free space are usually uh, in a hard drive, the free space which is not used. 
by the storage or by the volume. Unallocated clusters can be valuable source of evidence in a computer forensics examination. Why? Because they can contain many deleted files. Remember? It's been unticked to or written. But they are still there. And uh, a computer or user can use it anytime when the computer decides to write it. Slack space, on the other hand, is the unused space in the last cluster of a file where the logical size of the file does not fill the complete cluster. The file slack can contain fragments of all data previously stored in that cluster. Okay, but so, a smart user can have used software that, re that erased all the traces of these. Of course. Um, for in this, spaces. in the module one, we, as you remember, we had disk erasers. Uh, a good way. So now I want to give a real case example, which happened. Uh, I want to uh, send my greetings to Shukri Shukudurmas, a friend of mine, uh, master in forensics, okay? Uh, to be honest, he was leading the case. I was just there with him. What happened is me and uh, Shukri were invited uh, in a very big retail store. They called us and their, their whole system was down. They couldn't sell anything, and uh, they, you know, it took for the first six hours of the day they could not sell anything to their customers, and it was a disaster. Anyway, uh, from backup they restored it back, but the management decided to do a forensic investigation and find out what happened. So, from for us we were not sure. We were there with under Shukri's. Uh, supervision to see if, if it was an unauthorized access or a data sabotage. So we know that there is a SQL database and we found out that the admin password was deleted and all user permissions were cleared. So someone has information and uh, to protect the privacy of the case that uh, you know that's what we first asked does anybody knows that we're coming there. Uh, when we find out that nobody knew from the admin team that we were invited to do the investigation, we took our tool set, we went there. Of course, first we took all, we imagined everything to yeah. make sure. But hey, we had 20 administrators, okay? Who did, who did done this? So if you're gonna take image of 20 computers, and do full analysis, it will take days and days and days. A, probably budget is gonna be too expensive. B, I don't wanna spend 40 days in a case <laughs> to find out. So what have we done? Based on what happened, uh, Shukri suspected it was an insider. We split into two, we started to uh, interview the administrators. What happened, uh, you know, Based on the behavior, one of them were very suspicious because uh, when they found out we were there, one of the suspects started to say, hey, can you, uh, can you restore anything? We said, yes. Can you see deleted logs? We said, yes, you know. Uh, he started to ask funny questions. I reported this to Shukri. He said, okay, this is not a case. I mean, this is not a proof. But what we can do is, we can start to investigate he's from he's this computer. Why? Because he's the suspicious one. Uh, when we looked, uh, you know, I think I got it on the slides as well. We had 20 computers, one server, one RAM image, and all have, we have to analyze all of this in a very short time. Where are we going to start? As I said, uh, this, this was, we had one suspicious file, not file, person, and how there is Edmund Lockhart. He is the father of forensics, okay? He is a co-principal, which says, a crime cannot occur without leaving a trace. So, with contact between two items, there will be an exchange. Let's say you go, it's Seattle, right? We are in Seattle here. I don't know where you're watching this session, but we are in Seattle. It rains all the time. <laughs> uh, 
you might have a boot, you press on the mud, you, you step in the mud. If you step in the mud, the mud will have your footprint yeah. and your boot is going to have some mud. So there will be an exchange between two items. If I hit you, dear Ryman, so you're going to have a red mark yeah. in your skin and you're going to be in pain. It's and I'm going to feel, I'm going to feel while I'm hitting you, your skin. So two way. Okay, this was not the best example. <laughs> But what have we done? We found out that some sort of logs were deleted only from one computer. Uh, then this, you remember the user came and asked, did you delete the logs? When we, we could use PowerShell as well. Then we use our forensic software. We found out that only one computer were, had huge gaps between the logs. Okay, we could continue um, to, I mean, to be honest, I was started to continue to do the forensics, but then Shukri started to interview the second files. Okay, after a little while, uh, while we found out that the, the person who was suspicious, that, you know, after saying, hey, we have all the traces, uh, we done a keyword search, we looked in the SQL logs, we looked in the log recoveries, we checked the event date, the time chart, the installed software, and we found out that only one computer was different to the rest 19. And right after 30 minutes, we were able to f see that that suspicious guy done some search in his computer. He went to his favorite search engine, and he, I mean, this is a proof that he Search how to earn SQL server logs. But again, this could be you know, done in any other date. This gave us some uh, suspicious, uh, you know, this gives more proof to the sus suspicions, right? Then we found that he downloaded some scripts and he executed the scripts and he changed it, but he deleted the scripts as well. We found proof that the deleted scripts were still in his computer. What else? Uh, we were able to see that he didn't just delete the logs. He didn't just download, uh, done a Bing search. He didn't just download the script. He also had an Excel, which was deleted, file uh, of all the wages of any other employees. When I reported this to Shikr, he went to the IT manager and he spoke to him, said, hey, did anybody ask for salary increase? And guess what? It was that one suspicious person who wanted the salary increase as well. And After the final investigation, he admitted what he had done. But they did not take this issue to the court because uh, it was a huge company. Of course, they uh, break the contract with the employee but they let him go. He was lucky because he could pay for all our services, which I can assure it wasn't free. And um, in the previous sessions, Hussain was here as well. He, I know he has many other similar cases. So back to forensics. It can be done uh, in what happened is unauthorized access, data sabotage was done there. The Excel sheet was there and when we looked into the emails, we also find out, by the way, that he sent someone an email saying the company didn't pay what I deserve and I gave them some hard time. <laughs> more importantly, okay, more importantly, he, he was making fun of his actions. So he thought uh, sending an email and deleting the email is not going to give us access. He thought deleting some files is not going to give us access. Yes, we were lucky. Uh, not, we were lucky we had Shukri with us, who was really experienced and who done more than 3,000 forensics cases. Okay? Even though I, teach, I used to teach forensic classes, forensic is a different expertise area. I'm, I'm still here teaching forensics. But you need really to have uh, your sixth sense very powerful to be able to sniff. 
you have to be the wolf, like I saying, to smell where the attack is coming from and to, to, to be able to have something into it. Anyway, I think we spoke too much. We are a bit over time as well. Yes. Let's summarize it. So what you're saying is that uh, for a real, doing g real good forensics is a matter of experience. That's rule number one. But you have to start. This is a perfect start for you. Uh, we had some level 100, 200, and 300, and some 400 uh, uh, examples here. Please, don't just watch seven videos and think you're a forensic expert. Take your time. Look into it deeply. Read. Read. Read and don't forget. I mean, um, everything has been log. Uh, it is. It's like think about your child when they were little. You let them run. Uh, you let them run between an area that you can see. If they cross this area, you either call them and slow them down. So this is what it is. Uh, we finished just module four. Me and Ayman, we're gonna be back with Module 5, Network 4 and 6, continue watching us. Thank you very much. Thank you.